kick us off. Uh, got it. And let me share my screen here. All right, how does that look? Oh, uh, good. All right, fantastic. So I'll <clears throat> kick us off here a little bit about the hazard and uh, how to get some alerts and preparedness. And then Taylor and Michael will go into more details on impacts. So I have a number of slides. So I'm going to try to go through this pretty quickly here. All right. So first and foremost, I, everyone should know this by now, but I'll cover it. We have the second highest earthquake risk in the United States here in Washington State. We have a really high tsunami risk from both local source CSZ, Cascadia Subduction Zone Earthquake, uh, Seattle Fault, Tacoma Fault type earthquakes, and distant source from Alaska, Japan, all over the Pacific. Uh, and also we have a high landslide risk. So today we're focusing on the Cascadia Subduction Zone. And it's approximately 700 miles long from northern, uh, from the northern California all the way up to British Columbia. And typically, in the past 10,000 years, has ruptured every about every 300 to 600 years. And the last rupture was in 1700. Uh, and there's about a 15 to 25 percent chance in the next 50 years that we'll have an at magnitude eight plus uh, earthquake rupture here on the Cascadia Fault. Uh, and this could be potentially shaking for three to six minutes, which is going to seem like forever. And there's going to be a tsunami that will be coming, it'll be hitting the outer coast within 10 to 15 minutes after the earthquake starts, uh, and then going into the inner coast uh, within 60 to 120 minutes. So it's in, so it's all 3,000 miles of our coastline is going to be impacted. And we will have aftershocks for years and years afterwards. So a couple updates here. Uh, I don't know if everyone's seen this. This is the updated uh, the shake map that United States Geological Survey creates. And this is based off of kind of like a four or five year uh, study on you know, 30 plus uh, shake maps that they did kind of an ensemble for. Uh, and it factors in the deep sedimentary basins under Everett, Seattle, and Tacoma. Uh, and it also has, it shows increased intensity of shaking along the outer coast, but also there's a, based on the latest understanding of the hazard here and the shaking, potential for shaking, there's a decreased uh, shaking intensity in central and eastern Washington. So bad news for the outer coast, good news for central and eastern Washington. Now, something I, I mentioned was the, the deep basins. So based off of the 3D simulations that the M9 group did at University of Washington and, and partners, um, they found out from the Tohoku earthquake that well, the cities and areas that were on top of a deep basin, which means miles of sort of loose uh, soil, uh, they sh shook more intensely. And unfortunately, that happens to be right underneath, uh, you know, our our big urban centers uh, where we have tall buildings. And what that means here, and probably most of you know this as well, is that there's a much more likelihood of uh, damage and potential collapse from tall buildings uh, because of this. Uh, and specifically, I'm talking about you know, the city of Seattle, Tacoma, and Everett. So not good news. Now, getting into some of the hazards here, so effects of shaking, and obviously landslides, fires, um, you know, bridge collapse, uh, building collapse. Um, so we all know this, but some things to consider too for your own homes is chimneys are uh, very dangerous. So they can both fall into your home and out of your home. So just make sure you, if you're retrofitting your home, sizing and retrofitting it, please definitely take a look at your chimneys because they're a big hazard. Now, unreinforced masonry buildings uh, are a big hazard as well. So you can see here, there's a URM database that uh, Department of Commerce and partners have worked on, and we're going to try to get that completed here in the next few years. Uh, but you can see here, I'm, I'm identifying all of those uh, URMs within Washington State. Uh, but you can see here in the Seattle area, uh, up in the Everett area, I mean, there's 
a lot of unreinforced masonry building. So that's a huge risk, not only to the structures themselves, but also all of the surrounding structures uh, and all of the surrounding infrastructure. So quickly here, I mentioned uh, landslides, fires. We also have liquefaction uh, is a huge risk and tsunamis. Um, and of course, I'll get into aftershocks here a little bit more. So liquefaction, uh, you can see on the bottom right. So that was a stormwater infrastructure that popped up through the, through the, the street there. Um, I don't think we would have any buildings, say slump or collapse here uh, in Washington state uh, due to liquefaction, but definitely a lot of damage to roads. And we have a big landslide risk as well. And this can happen, landslides can happen days after the major event as well. And they can cause localized tsunamis as well. We have a history of that. And of course, fires. So fires is a big one. This is 1906 San Francisco earthquake. And there was a lot of damage from the earthquake itself, but a lot more damage from fires raging through the whole city. So that's gonna be a big problem because we don't have access to water. Uh, and the transportation routes for, uh, you know, for firefighting is going to be blocked uh, in many, many areas. So that's going to be a huge challenge uh, dealing with fires, urban fires. I mentioned aftershocks. So Christchurch uh, in 2010, 2011. So after the 7.0 September 3rd, 2010 earthquake, uh, these two buildings, uh, were okay, they did not collapse. And then aftershock, the 6.3, uh, February 22nd, 2011, then you can see what the buildings look like. They collapsed after that. So with aftershocks, they can be more devastating locally uh, in some areas than the main shock. There's something to be aware of. So getting into tsunamis, uh, this is the big killer uh, for the Cascadia subduction zone uh, event. Uh, and there's going to be a lot more people potentially that will suffer, will either will die or there'll be casualties caused by the tsunami than there are the earthquake. Uh, and the reason for this is obviously there's not a lot of high ground on the outer coast. Uh, but something to know here for tsunamis in case you're not up on what they are, uh, they're it's, entire, it's essentially the entire ocean moving towards Washington state with from the uplift of, from, the, uh, from the earthquake. And it's a series of long waves uh, that you know, typically come in about every hour and they will go in and out and in and out all through the sound, all through 3000 miles of coastline uh, over 12 to 24 hour period. And the first wave is not necessarily the highest uh, and this is essentially like a wall of cement with all of the debris, uh, ships and uh, docks and uh, sand and rock and logs and everything else that it moves along uh, with this wall of water. Uh, and so it's gonna be quite devastating here for Washington state for the whole maritime community, all the infrastructure on the coast, all boats, all vessels. To give you an example, 2011 Tohoku uh, in Japan, uh, it was considered a local event because it was right next to Japan. Uh, they lost over 28,000 ships and over 319 ports were destroyed. Uh, in California, same event, but it's a distant event. Obviously, it took I think, over eight hours for that wave, first wave to arrive to California. They had over $100 million worth of damage in 24 harbors, uh, some of which are still trying to recover. So on some updated modeling that just got completed in the last year, uh, you can see here in Seattle, Harbor Island, uh, and Duwamish Waterway. We're not looking at a lot of inundation. Um, you know, cover most of Harbor Island, uh, 3.7 feet. Uh, you know, in Duwamish Waterway, 4.4 feet. So, but the thing is, is it's the entire uh, ocean moving with everything else in it, which makes it so dangerous. So, it'll be easy to get to high grounds uh, for most folks and it won't come in inland very much, but the maritime uh, risk is huge. In Tacoma here, Port of Tacoma, this is actually good news because we had thought there's potentially 10 to maybe 15 feet of inundation, uh, but with updated modeling, it's looking like it's like three and a half feet 
ish, uh, which is a lot better uh, than we thought, but still you can see it covers the water will cover the entire port there. Um, so also a huge risk. Um, and then here for Olympia, you're looking at potentially a half a foot. Uh, so not again, much inundation here, but still very powerful waves. Uh, and it will take waves to arrive about four hours to arrive here. So plenty of time to get away from the water. Something also I wanna mention is Shakler earthquake early warning. So uh, many of you have probably heard of this, hopefully. Uh, we launched it uh, in Washington State here on May 4th this year. Uh, and essentially it's a, uh, a system that uses seismic monitoring stations throughout the West Coast of the United States to detect earthquakes rapidly, assess whether or not they're gonna be damaging, and then send out uh, seconds of warning to people who are gonna be experiencing the shaking. This is so they can drop cover and hold on and, and take protective actions. Now, if you hopefully if you if you have an iPhone or Android phone, you have turned on your wireless emergency alerts. So your public safety messages, your uh, emergency alerts, public safety alerts, all of that. So hopefully those are all turned on. If you don't have them turned on, please check your phones and go turn them on so that you can receive uh, earthquake early warning. And this is what the, uh, the message looks like when it will go off on your phone. Earthquake detected, drop cover and hold on, protect yourself. Uh, and it's also in Spanish as well. If you have the settings set for Spanish. Also Android has this built in to their operating system. Uh, so if you have an Android phone, you have to check to make sure your earthquakes um, alerts or notifications are turned on. And we have instructions on our mill.wa.gov slash alerts page as well. And a little bit of protective action here, a little bit of uh, preparedness have to go into this since uh, we're presenting here. Please do not try to run during an earthquake. Uh, I know it's kind of the react, you know, people, that's how a lot of people react, but please do not try to run during an earthquake because because you're most likely get injured from things falling on you either within a building or outside of a building um, or being knocked over while you're trying to run remember to drop cover and hold on check yourself until it's safe until the shaking stops and then uh, get somewhere safe and if you are near the coast in a slime inundation zone then as soon as it stops shaking and you feel safe to move then get to high ground as quickly as possible. And expect to be on your own for quite a while. It's gonna be, it's gonna be a bit bad situation. All right, and I have some more information here. You can go to mill.wa.gov slash alerts or to our tsunami page. Um, and we have a lot of great videos as well here. Um, now I will pass this on to Taylor. All right, thank you, Maximilian. So now I am going to share my screen here. Just one moment. All right. And it looks like I'm sharing my PowerPoint. So there we go. All right. Um, first of all, uh, good, good evening, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Taylor Hennessy, and I am the a critical infrastructure and private sector program manager with the emergency management division with Washington State. Um, a lot of what I'm going to go over now is uh, the some of the studies that we've done and the impacts um, that we've looked at post the Cascadia subduction zone uh, earthquake. So let's move right along here. All right, so um, four main topics I'll be covering, the Washington Regional Resiliency Assessment Program, the Business and Infrastructure Branch, State Business Emergency Operations Center, and then the sector, private sector risk and response. Um, so first here we have uh, the Washington Regional Resiliency Assessment Program. Uh, what this is, it's a program that we 
uh, work with the Department of Homeland Security, Cybersecurity, and Infrastructure Security Agency to identify planning gaps and opportunities to strengthen infrastructure resiliency through the Regional Resiliency um, Assessment Program. So ultimately, this enhances our knowledge of infrastructure and um, strengthens our plans, our catastrophic plans, and it helps us build important relationships with industry owners and operators, as well as bringing all of those key stakeholders into the same room um, who would definitely be talking during an incident. Um, so currently online, you are you would be able to find the transportation RRAP that is uh, on the Washington Emergency Management Division's uh, website. Uh, it's published. And this looked at our uh, transportation systems within uh, Washington state. Uh, it looked at the seismic vulnerabilities and uh, the resilience of uh, those systems and the tailored outcomes were to inform more directly the state and uh, the federal catastrophic um, or ca Cascadia subduction zone logistical response plans. So how we're gonna be moving goods uh, based off of the uh, impacts to the roadways and the bridges. And so uh, in addition, the state and the regional stakeholders stressed uh, at the beginning of the study, the importance of transparency. So we can truly assess and see what is what the outcome is going to look like, uh, what those impacts are to our bridges and our roadways. So additionally, uh, there is a tool created called the Bridge Seismic Screening Tool, the BSST, and that assessed the potential impacts that a Cascadia subduction zone earthquake could have on state highway bridges and determine the approximate reopening times for each of the bridge. Uh, also prioritize state highway routes for response and recovery efforts. Uh, so looking at um, incident, primary incident support bases and federal staging areas and prioritizing the best state highway route to connect uh, those two areas. So an incident support base um, receives or will receive resources from across the United States as, um, as we're looking for support um, post a, a CSV earthquake um, and we'll be receiving support obviously from locations outside of the areas uh, primarily impacted by the earthquake. Um, that's, those are the resources that will be targeted toward the ISBs. And then the federal um, staging areas are the, the locations that are located within the impacted areas for distribution to surrounding communities. So again, looking at prioritizing the state highway routes that will be uh, most drivable, um, most accessible post a catastrophic earthquake. Um, this, the study also looked at the hazard exposure of maritime and rail transportation systems. Uh, it didn't go too in depth on those areas, but there are certainly some analysis that is added to the report on uh, maritime and rail. Uh, as Maximilian had stated, the impacts to maritime are going to be uh, quite significant. Following uh, the transportation RRAP, uh, there was a need for assessing aviation, uh, looking at the airfields and airports. So uh, last year, uh, we conducted the Aviation Resilience Project. So it wasn't as uh, long term of a study as the overall resiliency assessment program, but it was a project. And so this uh, project provided stakeholders with a more complete multimodal uh, statewide assessment of the Washington transportation systems with the goal to ascertain the ability of Washington airports and airfields to serve uh, state and federal disaster supply chain staging areas. Uh, the next RRAP that we had conducted, uh, again, this is one uh, hasn't been published yet, but uh, will be sometime within likely the first quarter of this coming year, uh, is the Washington water RRAP, and that looked at 
seven different counties along the Puget Sound, uh, looked at the determination of potentially viable water sources post the catastrophic um, earthquake, the, the, the Cascadia subduction zone. And so after we uh, conducted these uh, interviews and data collection and had done some analysis, one of the uh, challenges that was identified across the counties uh, was that the surface transportation and the communication uh, disruption are going to significantly impact just the response time for the operators to get to those systems and to be able to, um, to, to fix what needs to be um, turned off or um, adjusted once the shaking starts. Um, also, there's just a need overall um, throughout local and state and federal and with the operators and owners of the uh, different infrastructure for information sharing so we can understand the expectations, the priorities and the different types of support. And that is uh, one of the goals with the water RRAP so we can further that planning. All right. And okay, so I'm now going more into um, what we'll what we'll be looking at uh, post -Cas uh, Cascadia subduction zone. Uh, the business and infrastructure branch uh, within the state emergency operations center is where a lot of the um, the coordination will take place with the different stakeholders, uh, the lifeline. ESFs or the emergency support functions. Whenever I say lifeline, what I'm referring to is um, CISA. They have the uh, 16 different critical infrastructure sectors. Within those 16 sectors, there are four sectors that if uh, those were to go down, it, it uh, would keep the other sectors from uh, being able to function properly. There's just so many interdependencies uh, throughout um, those different critical infrastructure sectors that we we need those uh, in order for the others to run. So that's transportation, communication, uh, water and wastewater and uh, energy. But you can see that we also coordinate with agriculture as well. And that was actually an outcome of uh, our response during COVID because of all of the different supply chain disruption, disruptions that we had um, had with the um, the overall grocery sector and um, being able to make sure that those goods were flowing. Uh, again, in the business and infrastructure branch, what we're really doing is we're looking at infrastructure priorities and uh, working with those emergency support functions, which are led by state agencies who have the close relationships and partnerships with those different industries that allow us to understand how to prioritize where um, the need is and uh, what the infrastructure partners um, are seeing issues with. So then it helps us paint an overall um, better picture with the, the situational um, assessment. Uh, lastly here, I have a bullet point on the business re-entry. I, I did want to mention that because of the, um, the interest and in, uh, the need for the private sector to be able to access their facilities post a incident. And uh, what the business reentry framework does for the private sector is it allows them to register with the state through the business reentry registration form uh, to show that they have critical facilities that they would need access to uh, in, in order to get those those critical systems up and running in a community so um, response can, can happen and recovery uh, can, can continue once uh, response is, is complete. Um, so that is a framework that um, we're continuing to, to work on, uh, but it is really important for our businesses to be able to access their facilities and to um, especially get our critical infrastructure owners and operators to like the communication towers, um, to the, the water system in order to make the proper repairs to support the community's recovery. Um, so that, that is something uh, that 
that we find to be very important and so does the private sector. Um, business Emergency Operations Center, I did wanna to touch on this as well. Um, so this is where we will be um, communicating with our private sector partners. Uh, we understand the importance of integrating the private sector into our response. Uh, we're always looking at a whole community response. So uh, most certainly during a, uh, a Cascadia subduction zone type earthquake incident, uh, we will be working with the private sector. And what's important is that we have an open communication uh, with them. So bi-directional information sharing. So not just one way, it's not just um, the private sector providing us information, but it's also us giving them information, operational information, so they can make uh, critical decisions to support their business needs, to support their uh, employees, and overall just the community as a whole. Um, this is ultimately going to help with operational decision making. It helps us with strengthening partnerships uh, with those critical infrastructure, infrastructure partners and uh, gives the different industries a voice in the, the state emergency operations center. So we can then take those, um, those key concerns and push it up to uh, the policy room, the policy um, decision makers. Uh, also, uh, it's a way for us to see if there's any capabilities that the private sector might be able to support the state with uh, if we're experiencing any gaps or if they're wanting to um, provide some additional support, then it helps us with being able to kind of navigate them and showing them how um, they can best support the current needs. Uh, lastly here, uh, just want to touch on the private sector planning piece. Um, so before COVID, I was doing a lot of outreach with our private sector partners in the communities, going out um, in person and giving presentations. We've continued to do that, but it's obviously been um, virtual and through more just information sharing through emails and through our website. Uh, but the importance is that our private sector, whether small business to large business, they truly understand their regional and local hazards. We all know that uh, there are people from all over the United States who move to the Pacific Northwest. It's a beautiful part of the United States. And uh, so we really want uh, the businesses to, um, to share with their employees preparedness information uh, so they know and understand what their hazards are. Um, so that's part of you know, looking at creating a culture of preparedness within their office environment. Uh, and then beyond that, it's our businesses creating uh, business continuity plans, understanding uh, that they need to take that, that type of planning very seriously uh, because of the different types of threats and hazards that exist uh, within our state. While it might not be as frequent or as visible as a hurricane um, on the East Coast, so we, we certainly do see the wildfire impacts and uh, we know that we do have this um, risk of a catastrophic earthquake. And of course, we've um, felt the pains from supply chain over the past couple of years. So here are some resources if you all are interested uh, in learning more. Uh, there is the business preparedness website, which is uh, just at mill.wa.gov forward slash business. If you'd like to take a further look and read about uh, the transportation systems, uh, the resiliency assessment, that, that one is really uh, very informative and it goes into a lot of um, those, those findings. So I highly recommend uh, that, that um, document. And then CISA, I really like to uh, push their website because they just have a lot of good um, planning tools as well. And uh, the importance of building private public partnerships. Uh, it's key for the, the program that I work for and um, just something that we constantly want to make sure that we're taking that whole community approach and bringing the private sector into our overall um, preparedness and our response and the whole emergency management um, spectrum. So with that, I just wanna say thank you and I will now pass it over to Michael.
Uh, thanks, Taylor. Um, I am going to share my screen here. All right, I hope everybody can see my screen. Um, as was mentioned at the beginning, uh, my name is Michael Roberson. Uh, I'm the planning supervisor for uh, Washington State Emergency Management Division. Um, and so what that means is I'm responsible for uh, the state comprehensive emergency management plan. Uh, that's the plan we implement whenever we uh, activate our state emergency operations center. Um, but it also is a plan that captures what we do day to day in order to um, uh, help the state when it comes to the threats and hazards that we face. Um, we also uh, develop what's called a catastrophic incident annex. And um, the reason we do that is because there are some very special uh, things about a catastrophic incident that go beyond just our normal day-to-day uh, -day emergencies. Uh, Maximilian talked a lot about the uh, Cascadia subsection zone uh, earthquake and tsunami. Uh, that would be uh, an example of a ca uh, catastrophic incident. Uh, and so regardless of what the cause is, um, what's going to happen is going to have extraordinary levels of damage, mass casualties, uh, disrupt uh, communities, um, uh, infrastructure, the economy. Uh, and so it's going to have a, a large uh, impact um, on the, the people, the place uh, that it occurs. Um, and so here's one way that we like to look at uh, what a catastrophic incident is, because there are two really important features to note when we're talking about catastrophic incidents. Uh, one is that regardless of how capable a community is, a catastrophic incident by its nature will exceed that capacity. Um, and so no matter how good your firefighting services are, no matter how good your search and rescue services are, no matter how good you are at, um, at repairing, restoring critical infrastructure, um, it's likely that a catastrophic incident is going to um, uh, overwhelm your current capacity. Uh, but it also is, uh, it gives you a double hit because it also uh, reduces your ability to respond uh, because many of your responders um, become uh, uh, in, in essence victims within uh, the incident. So as a result, um, we, are take, we, we are taking a triage approach uh, when it comes to um, uh, how we respond at cash off incident. And so uh, if any of you have had any medical training, you are aware of this, this concept. Uh, you focus on the things that um, are most likely to keep a person alive, uh, their airways, um, uh, making sure they're breathing, their, their circulation um, uh, and, and bleeding. And so you're looking at the things that have the biggest impact and saving sustained life. And so what we've done is we've taken... Um, uh, we, there are 32 emerging management core capabilities and the capability is uh, a, a set of tasks uh, necessary to uh, accomplish goals in these areas. Uh, and so we've taken those 32 and we've broken it down to uh, these primary capabilities and these supporting capabilities to take this triage approach. So we're focusing in on critical transportation, mass care services, public health, health care, EMS, fatality management, uh, infrastructure systems, which includes um, our, our energy grid, uh, fuel, uh, water and wastewater, uh, and communications. Um, and supporting those are operational coordination, operational communication, situational assessment, and logistics and supply chain management. And by supporting, it means that you have to do those four things in order to enable us to be able to carry out those primary capabilities. So, for our catastrophic uh, planning uh, effort, um, we're looking to scale, to, to build to the scale that is required um, for such a large scale potential incident. Um, we're also taking an iterative approach, which I'll talk a little bit more uh, about later. Uh, and we are, uh, we are working um, uh, to build out our capacity and understand what we as a state can do in order to uh, facilitate local response in the, those, in those areas, those core capabilities that I uh, just mentioned. 
Uh, as I mentioned before, um, this is not just um, the state um, that is responsible for this. Uh, I am the co-chair for the statewide cash traffic incident planning team. You can see here we have many partners, and this is just a cross-section of the partner agencies that uh, um, uh, participate in the SCIP. Uh, and so we are working um, uh, at, at, as a collective uh, to be able to build our capacity to plan for and respond to these catastrophic uh, level incidents. Uh, as part of that, uh, we developed a catastrophic incident planning framework, uh, which basically lays out um, uh, the, the important roles and responsibilities um, at the state and local levels uh, for each of these, um, uh, each of the, the core capabilities I talked about that have the biggest impact on saving and sustaining life. Um, there's a link here if anybody's interested in taking a closer look at this document. Um, as I said, this is uh, an iterative approach that we're taking. And so um, we started with critical transportation uh, in our planning efforts uh, because uh, transportation's outsized uh, impact on our ability to respond. And so uh, that's where we started our, our process. And so we start looking at um, uh, what, what's important on the critical transportation side, what routes are most important um, at the local level, at the state level, uh, in order to move goods and, and support into and out of communities and for those communities to move that support within their communities. Um, but as we uh, expanded our scope and start looking at mass care, then that, that means going back to our critical transportation routes and saying, okay, are the mass care shelters we've identified or the, the community points of distribution we've identified, are those captured as part of our uh, critical transportation? Uh, the same as we go through and we look at water infrastructure systems or the power grid, making sure that things that are, that are considered uh, critical in those areas are also reflected in our critical transportation, uh, our critical transportation planning. Uh, same thing for our mass care planning, making sure that the fuel needed to keep shelters running uh, is been, has been captured as part of, um, uh, has been part, has captured as part of that planning process as well. So as I said, we started with our, our critical transportation um, and, and the reasons are obvious. Um, when you don't have access, uh, it makes it very difficult to respond uh, to those areas. Uh, it means you you have you're looking at uh, alternate means of response. You're looking at having to do temporary structures to be able to reach uh, certain communities, and so that's where we started our process. And this is just giving you a little bit of uh, idea of what the the core capability for critical transportation is, and kind of what the important uh, pieces of it are. Uh, whether we're talking about establishing our access. Uh, making sure that uh, we can meet our human needs. Um, and then we're talking about uh, clearing debris, uh, not necessarily managing debris, uh, although uh, in some areas, it, it, those two things are, are not mutually exclusive um, because there really is no place to, to clear the debris without uh, actually removing it. Uh, Taylor talked about the, uh, the RRAP, and so I'm not going to go into a lot of um, uh, detail here other than just to, to point out that uh, it's a good document that we can, we can use, and it, it developed uh, two really uh, good tools, the BSST, Bridge Seismic Screening Tool, um, uh, and the Highway Seismic Screening Tool uh, that allow uh, communities to be able to, to assess um, their priority routes um, to, to get an idea that what we think is, is likely to happen to, to the bridges and, and highways in terms of liquefaction on those routes and to plan accordingly. Um, just because a route is likely to be damaged does not mean the route is still not a priority route. And so being able to account for uh, how we get around potential damage to uh, priority routes and, and how we deal with potentially isolated communities, uh, it's a good tool to be able to do that on the front end uh, as we're planning. Uh, just a little bit of the findings uh, on the RRAP. It gave an idea of, um, uh, of what's going to be damaged. Uh, so you're looking at 76% um, uh, uh, of, uh, um, of bridges experience some level of damage. Um, you're looking at 40% uh, uh, projected uh, experience significant damage. Um, uh, and, and so it, it's a it's a potentially grim uh, looking picture for what's gonna happen to our uh, transportation routes. 
uh, post uh, uh, CSC. And so it's important, uh, as important as ever to plan for uh, what we're gonna do before the incident happens. Uh, so one of the things that uh, our partners at uh, Washington State uh, Department of Transportation have done is they developed uh, what they're calling their, uh, their seismic lifeline routes. And so that's uh, I-5, uh, up uh, 405 around Seattle, and then um, uh, I-90 out to Moses Lake. Uh, and so um, these areas are, are have, or have, have been or will be retrofitted to make them more survivable uh, 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 during a CSZ. Uh, survivable does not mean perfect, uh, but it does mean uh, in better shape uh, to be able to um, uh, uh, have emergency repairs restore uh, access sooner rather than later. Um, and so from our standpoint, we had a couple of goals um, in our critical transportation planning uh, piece. Uh, we wanted to define what are called essential elements of information. So that's that's how, how do you assess um, uh, what state things are in uh, after an incident. Uh, we also wanted to identify our state priority routes. Uh, we wanted to work with our local and tribal partners to identify their priority routes. Uh, and again, the priority routes are, you know, how, how is help coming into your jurisdiction from uh, whether it's from a, a local airport, a rail port, um, a sea or a river port, uh, or through an, another jurisdiction? Uh, how's that help coming into your community? And then once that help arrives, how are you going to distribute that help to meet your internal response priorities? And so if that's getting to your schools, if that's getting to um, uh, your, uh, um, uh, your mass care shelters, uh, wherever those internal priorities are, what are the routes that are necessary in order to, to meet that? Uh, we wanted to assess um, what the local capacity is. Uh, that's, that's blue sky, that's on a, on a regular day without an incident. What's your capacity to, to do the things that are necessary to both assess um, the condition of those priority routes uh, and then also to do the, the route clearance, um, the emergency repairs um, that are necessary to restore um, uh, a functioning trans uh, transportation uh, uh, system in the state, uh, to understand what, our, uh, what we as the state can do to contribute to um, uh, restoration of those um, uh, assessment and restoration. Uh, and then what um, we can look to our federal partners to help meet those, uh, those unmet needs. Uh, finally, uh, our goal um, uh, is to be able to use uh, the tools, the bridge seismic screening tool, the highway seismic screening tool to be able to assess, um, here's what we think is going to happen to these priority routes uh, post uh, CSZ, uh, and then to be able to do some alternate route planning uh, based on um, uh, what's likely to happen and uh, um, uh, what we what our best guess is what's going to happen. Uh, and, and the important part of, um, of all this coordination is that, you know, it may be very difficult for, uh, for us to communicate with each other after a CSC, you know, uh, cellular connections are going to be down. Uh, and so it's really important that a, I as, you know, uh, as uh, community A, uh, don't clear a priority route up to the border with my neighbor and find out they've done nothing to, to, to open that route. And so the goal is to be able to pre-incident, have a, a pretty decent understanding of what our priorities are and what we're going to be doing, what steps we're going to be taking post-incident uh, so that we can, we can map that out together beforehand instead of um, uh, being caught up in, in our, our lack of communications. So I talked a little bit about essential elements information. So we're looking at you know, the, the different um, uh, transportation modes and how we're gonna get information and share information um, uh, and where that information is gonna be coming from in order to assess, understand uh, what the status of those routes are and what the likelihood of restoration is going to look like. Um, and so part of our effort is uh, as I mentioned, uh, was to do outreach to our local uh, partners. And so we started that outreach uh, actually before um, uh, uh, we went into COVID lockdowns. 
uh, we we uh, restarted that um, uh, this year um, virtually, and we're able to con you know uh, reconnect with our partner agencies to um, in order to define our uh, party routes. And so this is just a, a snapshot of what we have so far in terms of. Uh, identifying what the priority routes are, um, and so the purple routes are uh, priority routes that we've we've been given by our local partners, um, but we have followed up with meetings to say, okay, let's let's sit down with our WASDOT partners and and go through these routes and make sure there's no there's there's no conflicts um, that we are we are establishing a transportation network, not just a number of of uh, of spaced out roads. Um, and so the red ones are the finalized ones, and then the the light gray, those are the the WASDOT priority routes that they've identified through this process. Uh, and so we've gone through this process and and looked at okay, here's where we kind of started, and then here's where we ended up with uh, having a full understanding of what the priority routes are within the community. Uh, so we are all on the same page about what our restoration goals are going to be looking like and where communities are going to be spending their effort uh, when it comes to uh, route assessment, um, uh, route clearance, and, and uh, emergency repairs. Uh, I mentioned before, um, eventually our goal is to be able to assess uh, where we are using the, the bridge site screening tool. Uh, that's that's a, a, a logical next step when it comes to being able to understand uh, where we, um, uh, where our uh, gaps are in terms of um, we're counting on certain roadways, but it turns out we, we um, are expecting some severe damage. And so what's the alternative uh, to that roadway we're really counting on? Uh, and then uh, using um, uh, that gap analysis that I kind of mentioned, which is to understand uh, what the capacities are at the local level, um, what we as a state can do to fill that capacity, and finally what uh, our federal partners can do to, to come in on the back end to be able to assess uh, that issue with the, with the idea that uh, what we want to be able to do is put, is particularly uh, in the first hours uh, after the incident is to push um, resources to these communities based on what we understand and expect their needs to be um, in each of the areas that, that we talked about uh, so far. Uh, so as I said, uh, I'm the planning supervisor. Uh, Kirk Holmes uh, with Partit is our SKIP co-chair, uh, and then Shane Moore and Nicole Bernardo are two of our planners that had uh, an outsized role in, um, in helping develop our cash traffic incident annex. And thanks everybody for your uh, your attention and, and giving us the opportunity to present here today. All right, well, thank you to our three presenters. It looks like we did get some questions in the chat um, during their talk. I think some of them got answered as we were going on, um, but I will read through them just in case anyone didn't read along in the chat as we're going. Let's find the first one. First question was, I think for Maximilian about the inundation models, um, where can we find them? Maximilian posted a link in the chat to where you can find them for those who are curious. Um, also, how much inundation is expected on the coast in places like Aberdeen, Oakwim, Long Beach, et cetera. I think Maximilian answered that in the chat recently. Um, 25 to 60 feet on the outer coast and five to 10 feet in Port Gamble in the Hoop Canal Bridge area. Hopefully that answers the question for uh, Patrick. Thanks for your question. See, the next one was where does NIMS fit into this all? And I actually don't even know what NIMS is. Taylor, could you elaborate on that one a little bit? I think you gave an answer already, but. Yes. So um, NIMS is the, uh, the National Incident Management System. And so um, 
it guides all levels of government um, and different organizations, private sector to work together uh, to protect against, mitigate, respond to, and recover from incidents. Uh, so it's just that, that like guiding system for all of us to be able to um, integrate and work together. And so we use that system. We take different trainings like ICS, the incident command um, structure, uh, in order to be able to respond and use uh, similar language whenever, whenever we uh, are responding to incidents. Sweet, thank you. Um, let's see, next question. I think this is our last one is from Bob. This is pretty interesting. Talking about the new uh, interstate bridge replacement program, the Vancouver I-5 bridge, which is, I believe, in preliminary design. Um, they, Bob says, they have mistakenly dismissed the best earthquake resistance option, which would be an immersed tube tunnel. Japan has built two dozen immersed tube tunnels. Buoyancy makes an immersed tunnel much more earthquake resistant than a bridge during liquefaction, like floating bridges. Um, the interstate bridge replacement program is offering three steep bridge options. All have 250 foot drilled shafts plus 150 foot piers. So 412 feet from the bottom of the foundations. What are our opinions on that? I know has, have any of our three speakers have knowledge about that program or the options or anything? Um, I personally don't really know much about that, but I, I am a geotechnical engineer, so I do know that tunnels are about the safest place you could be during a big earthquake. That's my input. <laughs> yeah, that that's that's not necessarily our, our area of expertise that that really would fall to our um, our partners at uh, both Washington uh, DOT and Oregon DOT as they work out their their best design uh, for that uh, replacement. Right. Well, Bob, I'd be happy to talk to you about that after this, because that is pretty interesting that they're not um, going that route. And Dick Sage says, I'm retired and have construction and construction management experience. Is there a way for me to get involved? Uh, do you mean with our emergency preparedness program or yes yeah i've uh when i was with sound transit i went through the uh, ics system up to 700 uh there's only one other course that i need to take within the nim system to see it ics 800 but um you know i've got some time uh, yeah. this is uh it's interesting to me I think Here. that would be, you, you'll have a few minutes to, to talk about that with our vendors after this. Um, I think right now, if, if anyone else has any questions about the presentations or about the work that our speakers do, uh, now would be a good time. And if there's no more questions about the presentation, then we could have Don take back over. And so, so I, I didn't want to respond to, so Dick, if you're interested in volunteering, uh, in helping out Washington Emergency Management Division, uh, we always love to have volunteers, so we could could use your help. So, yeah, you know, just reach out to us, and we can kind of see what you're interested in, what we have available for projects, and things that we need help with, and we can see if there's a match. Uh, can you send me uh, a contact uh, sure. or a way to get in contact with you? I'll put my email address right here. There you go. Great. Let me share my screen again.